what an honor it is to be here and to be a part of this very intentional program. So thank you for having me. Our two incredible speakers, and when I say incredible, I mean, it, it, it's really not just, it's, <laughs> there's no word to describe uh, these two individuals who do amazing work. Our first panelist, Monica Roberts, comes from Houston, Texas. I got on a plane and the, I feel like the Arctic blast got her here earlier than she anticipated. Uh, she's an award-winning human rights advocate and has been focused on black transgender rights for over 20 years and also the founder of her incredible blog, Transgrio. And Tony Newman, who is the executive director of St. James Infirmary, a peer-based occupational health clinic here in San Francisco that provides non-judgmental health care and social services for sex industry workers. So let's welcome them up to the stage and get our program started. Monica, sit there. All right. Wherever you like. These these seats are super comfortable. I'm going to take them home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine won't fit on the plane, though. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get right into it. Um, I mean, the reason for Transgender Day of Remembrance for many of us in the community was to mem memorialize the lives that we have lost, our transgender brothers and sisters. The National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs had issued some data back in 2017. And in that report, uh, they reported at least 27 hate violence homicides of transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. Of the 27, 24 were transgender women. Of the 24, 19 were black transgender women. In 2018, the Human Rights Campaign also put out a report of their own in which they reported at least 26 known uh, hate violence homicides of transgender individuals and a majority, again, black transgender women. And in 2019, we know of 22 and the year is not over. And again, the majority black trans women. Sadly, for many of us who are sitting here, or who are watching, or who are just right outside of these doors, um, the, this, these are stats, it's data, it's, it's headlines, but for both of you, it goes beyond that. This is your lived experience, a constant risk of violence. Let's, let's break that down. Let's start with you, Monica. Yeah, out of this year, the uh, 20, two that we know of, 21 are black trans women. And of the 21, about 18 of them are under age 30. So that's a loss not only to our black trans community, but it's a loss to society as a whole. What would these folks have been able to accomplish if they had been able to live to my age of 57? Did, did we lose the next great business idea, the cure for cancer, or whatever these folks would have been able to accomplish had they had time to be able to do that? And the other aspect of this is that many of these murders are intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. They are intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. So that's another conversation that we need to have. I started 25 years ago through my transformation. I graduated of Wake Forest and I found myself on the streets. Um, had a degree, had met my Angelo at Wake Forest and most of the people that I met in 1995 are now dead uh, from suicide, partner abuse, partner murders. And what I'm really here to say today is what do we do as a community to support one another. Whether you're in the LGBTQIAA, if I missed something, I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, what do we do? How do we support each other? Mm -hmm. um, we've lost some great people. A lot of talent has been lost. But what do we do in 2020 in order to support one another? What does equality look like if you are a hetero ally? What, what does equality look like 
if you are a member of the LGBTQIA. I don't see enough concern, enough empathy when these young ladies are being killed on the streets when most of us are asleep by people that they know. And especially I don't see that empathy from our own community. Yeah, I, I agree um, with that. Yeah, I agree with uh, that. That's, it's a problem when you have 21 African-American trans women killed. If all of these women were cisgender women, the NAACP, the Congressional Black Caucus, and every black legislator would be screaming at the top of their heads about this. Okay. But it's not, but we've got silence now. From and many and, of and to repeat that, if 21 gay men, white men, or black men were killed, there would be a rally in the streets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There would be, let's prosecute, mm -hmm. let's find the murderer. Mm -hmm. These people, over 80% of them were killed and their perpetrator is still on the loose. A lot of them, they put no effort into finding who has done this. And even if they do, uh, the sentences they get are a slap on the wrist. Yes, it's manslaughter, okay. misdemeanors, and not murder in the first degree. We just had a case in Texas in which the person who was videotaped uh, beating Malaysia Booker just went on trial last month. Mm -hmm. uh, the per, the uh, defense attorney used a variation of the trans panic defense to uh, unfortunately successfully get his sentence reduced from felony, uh, felony assault to a misdemeanor assault with time served. And my question is, just because someone says I'm a trans person, does that mean they should be killed mm -hmm. um, once they identify their authentic self? People are identifying their authentic self and people are saying, oh my God, I was so shocked, I had to kill him. Mm -mm. That doesn't happen in any heterosexual relationship that I'm aware of, that you say, hey, I'm, I'm a straight white female. Oh my God, I'm gonna kill you. Oh. So why is it that it's tolerated and approved for the black trans and Latin ex mm -hmm. and yeah. other people of color. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just emphasize black and mm -hmm. I want to recognize my Asian and, and Latin sisters, uh, my Indian sisters, but just trans people of color go through a lot to make it in this world. And why is it that we don't have the allies standing behind us saying we won't allow this to continue to happen? Mm -hmm. You must prosecute, you must treat this as murder. Why is it that you guys are not standing up for us? And my question to you is, what's holding you back? Mm. Why is that not happening? Yeah. Uh, my next question dovetails on that because there is the, well, the question of why aren't you doing anything? And then there are many of us who are in the community or who are allies or who read the headlines and are shocked and say, why is this happening? And so I think what we need to also do is really recognize uh, the, the issues that lead up to the violence mm -hmm. and really understand that, you know, when we say intersectionality, that that isn't just a buzzword or this modern term of our, our identities converging, mm -hmm. but that we understand the meaning of it, which was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, and the meaning of it for Kimberly was to address the oppressive forces um, that continuously marginalize, you know, people, and 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 not and create new categories of suppression. Yeah. So what I mean by that is, you know, we can't say that well. The answer to why this is happening is just transphobia, mm -hmm. or that it's just yeah. racism, or that it's just sexism, mm -hmm. but that a lot of oppressive forces are compounded to lead to that actual violence. So if we were actually going to do something, we'd have to understand that. Yeah, because uh, I can start with the, the number of murders has ramped up since 2015. Mm -hmm. What happened in 2015? The Obergefell ruling went down. And so what has happened, our, our I say, esteemed opposition basically made a call, conscious decision to attack the trans community. Politically, uh, also in conjunction with the Southern Baptist, the Roman Catholic Church, trans exclusionary radical feminist, and also the Republican Party. All of these groups are coalescing 
in a basically a, a push to basically eradicate trans folks from society. And how do they accomplish that? Demonizing trans kids, basically making it harder for trans adults to not only hold jobs, but also to, uh, say, to basically just get around in everyday life. Passing restrictive laws, like the attempt to pass uh, SB6, which was a bathroom bill in Texas. Uh, also, rolling back protections, like uh, the, the Department of uh, Education under, I say, under Cruella DeVos, as I call her, <laughs> uh, has rolled back to make it harder for parents and also for trans students to basically push back against the discrimination they face in school settings. Um, and, the, it's a, and Texas, in addition to other Republican parties across the nation, have planks in their platforms that call upon those legislators to openly oppose any trans rights advances in their states. In 2019, um, Donald Trump has made it a mission and a goal to really hurt 1% of the population of America. Transgenders as a whole make up 1%, and the percentage of trans people of color is, is half of that. And my question is, why would an administration focus on such a small group to kick them out the military, to strip them of being their authentic selves? What is the motivating force behind him and his supporters on not monthly but weekly continually to attack transgenders? And all that is is just being your authentic self. Mm -hmm. All a transgender is really trying to do is live an authentic life, find love from an authentic person, and be authentically happy. That's basically all we're really trying to do. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that makes the evil Jellicles mad. <laughs> so, you know, and also these trans exclusionary radical feminists, you know, who have been since Janice Raymond, uh, basically had that goal of eradicating trans people from society. And all of this negativity is basically fueling the anti-trans rhetoric mm -hmm. and, and that is inflating our murder rates. And it's not just a problem here in the United States, Latin America, Brazil, Eastern Europe, uh, all, let's say, areas, any area where you are pushing anti-trans rhetoric, the violence follows. So Texas, is leading the country this year in the most uh, transgender murder and deaths. This uh, year. You're from, mm -hmm. you're from Texas, and I think that there is something to be said about you know, elected leaders in that state mm -hmm. who have really created and cultivated the anti-trans culture. Yeah, and they started basically at 2015. Uh, one of the judges who made an anti-trans ruling at the federal level is based in Wichita Falls. Uh, his name is Reed O'Connor. Uh, and our lieutenant governor, who I lovingly call Potty Dan, Potty Dan Patrick, uh, starting that year, they have made, they made that attempt, to, that failed attempt to try to pass SB6. Um, the other thing that is driving a lot of this anti-trans rhetoric in Texas is the fact that the Republicans are on the verge of losing the Texas House. And the narrow loss of, of Beto O'Rourke in the Senate race last year uh, really scared them, combined with the loss of 12 Texas House seats. And the fact that the population of Texas is browner and getting, and getting more brown every year mm -hmm. since 2009. Basically, Texas is California. We, since 2009, the number of non-whites in Texas outnumbers the white population. That scares the Republicans that are in control temporarily of our government. Uh, the only reason that Texas is not totally blue right now is because of voter suppression and gerrymandering. Mm. 
And the other, let's say, major, let's say, so when you have a party that has been in, only in control of the tech, total control of the Texas government since 2002, and they don't have a whole lot of accomplishments to show for it, so what do they do? Push the transphobia button. Uh, it's not working uh, because, uh, fortunately, um, the folks in, you know, say, especially with the Latino community, we have every month 90,000 Latino youngsters who are voting age. And they, like, the, like what happened here in California around Prop 187, we have the same dynamic going on in Texas right now. They have pissed off the Latino uh, community for a generation. And it's going to start getting reflected in the voting patterns, if not now, within the next five years. We'll get to what do we do as allies, mm -hmm. and, and especially when it comes to uh, the ballot box or getting mm -hmm. to the polls. Um, but Tony, you know, something that we, you had mentioned on our ride here, uh, there, are, there is a lot of work in, as far as how you can show up and show up for black trans women. And I would say that you're a great example of that kind of leadership. You lead an organization that was just awarded, I think it's a million dollars. 1.15. 1 1.5, 1 congratulations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that is going to housing. Of, of transgender folks in the San Francisco Bay Area. And you had said that, you know, housing is a solution to the violence. It is. Let's, let's talk about that. Well, I want to say I have two of my new housing people in the audience. Matthew Payton is a social worker. Jesse Santos, stand up. They are the new housing navigator and social worker who will be leading. Um, Mayor Breed and the Board of Supervisors um, gave uh, um, St. James Infirmary and Larkin Street Youth Services $1.1 million for the next two years to fight TGNC, Transgender Gender Nonconforming Housing. Mm -hmm. And we'll be doing a residential house for those that have no income and they need to get on their feet and also providing subsidies provided by the Mayor's Office on Housing and Community Development. Mm -hmm. The problem is that most transgenders, even when they look for a job, they don't have a place to stay. And all of you know, if you work here at Gilead, you didn't have a place to get dressed in the morning, get yourself together, no phone, no computer. How do you really operate in the society of 2019? Mm -hmm. So we figured uh, with Claire Farley, the director of the Office of Trans Initiatives, the only trans initiative city office in the country, it was appointed by Mayor Lee, um, and then took up by and renewed by Mayor Breed, uh, and thanks to Raphael and Matt Haney and Hillary Rosen, they want to say, what is it that transgenders needs the most? And what we need the most besides your support and your money is housing. To open up your, if you have a room that you'd like to rent to a trans person, um, the city of San Francisco is willing to pay you. Mm -hmm. If you know of an apartment uh, in San Francisco or Oakland that a trans person who's trying to get on their feet need, San, San Francisco, and the mayor's office on housing, we're willing to pay you. So what we're asking for now is we need landlords and people who have homes who want to rent to a transgender, gender nonconforming person. You get paid at a decent rate, but you're also helping an individual live their authentic life. Mm -hmm. uh, 24 years ago, <laughs> you know, 24 years ago, I found myself a graduate uh, rejected by peers, family. I had no one, and it was the transgender community on 14th Street in 1996 that um, wasn't educated, but they taught me and they loved me and became my family. And we found housing together and we lived together. And we need our allies to jump on board and help us with housing. If you own apartments, we're willing to pay you. If you have a room for rent, we're willing to pay you. But the problem will be, where will we rent? Who will rent to the TGNC community? Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be the problem. Okay. We had 10 minutes left and I wish we had two hours because mm -hmm. it would take forever for us to really break this down and, and get going. But uh, with that in mind, I think that we can discuss and talk about the biggest solution to this is 
loving black trans women, loving enough to where we're celebrating black trans women and their achievements and their work so that that also contributes to the cultural shift that we need to keep black trans women safe. So let's spend 10 minutes talking about celebrating those that we have lost and those who are living. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to say on that, while it's important for us to remember the folks we've lost, uh -huh. it's also important to realize that that, that um, tragic transsexual narrative is also annoying to a lot of us because we actually have black trans folks who are doing amazing things. You know, we have college professors like Marissa Richmond. We have a black trans woman who is the vice president of the Minneapolis City Council in Andrea Jenkins. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, say, we have people who are doing amazing, you know, like my sister here, Tony, you know, say, that are doing amazing things not only here but across the country. College professors, there's back home in Houston, there's a young trans woman, uh, Marcia Barnett, who is in in medical school and also earning a, a master's degree in business. So, you know, we have folks who are doing some amazing things, but unfortunately, we don't hear enough about that. The narrative um, a lot, and I agree with, with Monica about the death. You know, I cry and I support the families of the lost ones, but let's support the ones who are trying to do positive things. Let's support the living with volunteering. Mm. St. James is looking for volunteers. We work with the sex workers, the homeless, and the transgenders. We need people on the board. We need people to support us. And I want to acknowledge here that Gilead last year, through Mercedes as Karate, as I repped, gave us over $30,000 mm -hmm. to support the people who need it most. And for that, I say thank you to your support at Gilead. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that we need. Thank yeah. you very much. We also, to piggyback on uh, what Tony was saying, okay, as someone who lives in a southern state mm -hmm. and a Republican-controlled one, funding is what we need for a lot of our organizations there. Uh, there was a survey done about funding going to uh, say organizations in the South, and the South for this comparison was Texas and the old Confederate states, in which only 8% of any funding goes to the South, and it goes to two cities, Houston and Atlanta. And okay, if you're, a bl if you're sitting on the board of a black organization like I do in terms of Black Trans Advocacy Coalition, which is in Dallas, we don't even get any of that 8%. So we're definitely looking, and, and with the front lines of the struggle now being in Texas and the South, we need funding to help fight organizations that have CEOs that are making $100,000 and have all day long to think of ways to oppress us. We need that help. We have a minute left, um, so we'll be very quick, but I asked you this in the car, and I love the question, because what does, what does the perfect ally look like to you? As somebody who came in 20 years ago and saw a certain large equal sign organization being more of an oppressor to us than actually a ally, Equality means basically supporting the trans community, not cutting us out of legislation that we desperately need. It is supporting our organizations. Uh, it is equitable funding for those organizations. It is basically being there, standing up for us, even when we're not in the room. Yeah, because there are times when you're gonna have your fellow cis people basically maybe talking trash about us, and that's, that's where you as our cis allies are even more important to, you know, to, because when they do that, they're sounding out, I say, how much transphobia they can get away with. And if you tell that person, look, 
you know, I'm not comfortable with you saying that, or, you know, I have friends who are, or family members who are trans, uh, and that's not exactly true what you're talking, that usually shuts down the transphobia within your circles. So that, you know, that is one quick and easy way that you can support our community, you know, by speaking up and calling out the, you know, say the crap when we're not in the room. I would say very quickly, supporting with your money, uh, we work with uh, TGI Justice Project, Todd's Coalition, uh, Ella, Instituto de la Raza, mm -hmm. Mujeres en Acción, all groups, trans groups who are led by trans women uh, of color, trying to help people in various ways. So support yeah. with your money. Also, buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> I Rise, that, that will be hard copy next year. Oh, okay. So I Rise, The Transformation mm -hmm. of Tony Newman, came out five years ago. It's coming out in hard copy next year. And uh, it'll be in a movie uh, in 2021 led by Keith Holland from England and my husband, who's a producer, Alton Moore. Okay. Thank you. Let's thank Tony and Monica for being here with us today. That concludes the first portion of our talk. Um, I'll just- Mark Lino's <laughs> great. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, well, He's and, a and great ally. We're spending, we're spending this afternoon just as the day is what it's meant for, which is to remember those that we've lost, address the issues of our community, and then find a solution to it. And I'm gonna end with saying this. I love you, Tony. I love you, Monica. You both can have all my money and uh, any, any- We love yeah. you back. <laughs> yeah. But keep enough for yourself to yeah. keep a roof over your head. Don't get hungry. <laughs> our next guest speaker, the Honorable Mark Leno. <laughs> yeah. Um, He's been hailed by even his adversaries or political opponents as um, the legislator who has done the most to advance LGBTQ rights. As far as transgender rights, there are a few bills that I could name off right now, but many of them have to do with housing, expanding transgender health care in the city of San Francisco through Healthy San Francisco, uh, expanding on transgender workplace rights and even a bill that it, that any contractor or company to the state had to make sure that they equally offered transgender health benefits. And that's just a handful. And there are many more that we'll talk about in terms of what made him so successful um, and passionate even for our rights and uh, in the fight for equal rights. So let's Welcome the Honorable Mark Leno up to the stage. Hello, Michelle. Hey, Mark. I sat down right away. Mm. These okay, chairs, these chairs are so great. I can't wait great. to get into it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of work. So I mentioned a few bills. You've served as Board of Supervisor in San Francisco, the California State Assembly, two terms successfully as our state senator, and ran for mayor, I should say, um, in 2018 for mayor of San Francisco. And uh, what do you think about that quote? I, I stole that from Jeff Kors, actually, who's council member of Palm Springs and a good friend and also a, a gay rights activist. But he, he did say that he felt that you were the legislator who had done the most to advance LGBTQ rights um, in this state while in office. Uh, we'll focus on transgender rights, uh, but my uh, big question that I think many of us had, and even when Monica was speaking, you can hear the stress um, in when we're talking about solutions to create protections for transgender individuals is that it's gotta, it's, there's gotta be policy work that comes with it. And so for you, I mean, how did you get consensus? How did you get bills passed, you know, to with, with working with individuals who may not have had all the information, the education about issues that impact our community? Before I address your question, <laughs> I just want to say how humbling it is to be sitting in the seat and on this stage where Monica and Tony have just been. You inspire all of us. You are on the front lines. You are doing, as I told Tony, whether your mother agrees with me or not, the Lord's work every day of the week. And so to be here with you uh, on this solemn occasion, I mean, we're going to talk about some great things that we've done and, and why we have reason to be hopeful. 
that everyday things in the long run, the arc of justice does bend. That it is a time to remember those who have fallen in this battle for justice, for simple, basic humanity and human rights. Uh, I still keep in contact with Sylvia Guerrero, who's the mother of Gwen Arajo. Mm -hmm. Gwen was brutally metered, uh, murdered by high school classmates when she was age 17, 14 years ago. And what brought Sylvia and me back together just recently was that the murderers of her daughter are the last one is about to be released from prison. 14 years later, brutal murder, clearly a hate crime. And she's got to be back in court. Every one of those court dates is just a traumatic reliving of, of what she's already gone through. So uh, in memory of all those, and thank you, Gilead, and thank you, Commonwealth Club, and all of the uh, groups within Gilead who are here today to remind us and to put a face on it. Because we're going to be talking about legislation, which can sometimes get kind of dry and statistical. We're talking human lives, and it is, it is dangerous out there, as we all know. So jump into your question, how, why. You know, as a Jew and as a gay man, my whole life has been about being within a minority. And, and the questions that Tony and Monica raised, you know, how, why, we're talking about an infinitesimal amount of the population, why pick on people? And we don't know the, the answers to these questions, but they're the same questions that propelled people like Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. King. Uh, why do people do this? We don't know that answer, but we do know that there are political reasons. And as a Jew and as a gay man, I know what it's like to be the scapegoat. You know, don't, don't look over here, folks. It's, yeah, you, you can't pay for your housing, you can't access health care, traffic's a mess, you can't breathe the air. But if we only get rid of these people, everything's going to get better. And so that's the nature of, of hateful people who make their way into politics. Now, we're fortunate here in California because we are as blue as we are. And let me just say, my comments may get partisan. They're not meant to be. I'm just stating facts. Human rights is not a partisan issue. Never should be, never could be. Just have to look back to the Civil War days. Democrats were the ones holding on to a slave culture and financial system. It was the Republicans and Abraham Lincoln. You know, after President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill of 1964, he knew he was doing the right thing as a Texan, but he said the Democratic Party is signing off the South. And, and so we had to do what we had to do because it was the right thing to do, but there, were, there are political challenges. But it just shows it's, it's not a partisan issue. All, both parties have been in the wrong. And there's reason to believe that we could come together on some of these issues. I was on the Board of Supervisors in 1999 and very fortunate to have great staff, as I've had throughout my 18 years in public office. And we're only as good as our staff, and I've been very blessed. A fellow named Nathan Perkis, another gay man, informed me that a few years earlier, in 1994, the Board of Supervisors had held some hearings at the Human Rights Commission of San Francisco specifically to address the big issues and needs challenging our transgender community. 1994, public hearings, access to housing, health care, employment, education. Hearings were held, a report was written, and not uncommonly, as reports happened to find their way onto a top shelf somewhere and never heard from again. So it was Nathan's suggestion that we pull that report out, we form a first of its kind transgender civil rights implementation task force, and I emphasize the word implementation because we wanted this task force to not just write another report, 
but to inform the Board of Supervisors so that we could craft legislation that would respond to what that 1994 report was all about and what our newly formed task force would inform the Board of Supervisors. So it was a great opportunity for me, who had some friends in the community, but to meet a much larger number of transgender folks who were appointed to the task force, did their work, and then reported back to us. And among all the great needs within the community, you just look at the statistics of rates of unemployment, rates of homelessness, uh, lack of access to education, and their top priority was equal access to health care. So the way they suggested, and it was very brilliant in how it was figured out by the task force, that we should, and which I then did, author a local ordinance to provide equal access to the county health plan for transgender employees of the city and county of San Francisco. Back then, it was a workforce of about 26,000. I think it's closer to 30,000 today. But we identified about 17 people. So you think, well, 17 people out of 26,000, every life that we save is a life worth saving, but how's that going to move the needle? But I will explain that very shortly. So we came to learn that because in our contracting for our county health plan provision of it, uh, our insurers had not done the actuarial studies to be able to determine what costs might be if we did provide equal access. And so there were written into health plans, this was standard practice a couple decades ago, transgender exclusions written into the plans. Anything transgender related would not be covered by the plan. So every headline, despite how much we worked with the media, yelled, county to pay for sex change operations, right? That's, that was the, the hook they wanted to get into it. So we, well, we'd explain that's not all that we're doing. That's part of it, but that's what they wanted to write about. I got my first call to be interviewed by Bill O'Reilly on Fox Network. I didn't even know who Bill O'Reilly was in 1999, and my staff had to inform me, and after they did, they said, you do not want to go on his show. And after they told me who he was, I said, no, I insist, I want to go on his show. So it's not as if I'm flown to New York and I sit across a table from him. I went to a television studio on Broadway in San Francisco. I'm in a little black room with an earpiece staring into a little camera lens. So he can see me, I can't see him which puts one at a disadvantage for an interview, but those are the, that's the way it goes. In any case, not surprisingly, in the most boisterous introduction, I'll spare you the volume, but he said, supervisor, why should my tax dollars go to pay for someone's sex change operation? I said, Bill, well, that's not exactly what we're doing, so let me explain it to you. And what I told him was that if you are a non-transgender employee of the city and county of San Francisco and you're in need of psychiatric treatment, hormonal treatment, you need a hysterectomy, a mastectomy, the county health plan pays for all of it. Not a penny out of your pocket. But if you're a transgender employee of the city and county of San Francisco in need of the identical medical care, health plan will pay for none of it. And when I finished, Bill O'Reilly said to me, Supervisor, you make a compelling argument. And I took that as success. Yeah. But it was an important lesson for someone very new to legislating public policy and the elected office, which is when talking to even the most hateful adversary, if I could make a cogent, rational, thoughtful argument I could even win over Bill O'Reilly. And that's what we're talking about today, right? We're, as Tony so, you know, just to live an authentic life, we're just talking about basic stuff. When we break it down like that, people 
I do still believe, do not have an inclination to want to be hateful or to discriminate, but a lot of people are just ill-informed, uninformed, and when we can raise their awareness, we can change hearts and minds, and we do. And so, as I said earlier, so what's the big deal, 17 people? Of course, in, we're taught in the Talmud to save one life is to save the whole world. So we're saving worlds uh, in helping 17 people access health care. But, and this was what the Transgender Civil Rights Implementation Task Force understood, once San Francisco amended its health plan, and it didn't raise the cost of premiums to the other 26,000 in the system by more than pennies a month. One by one, private insurers dropped their transgender exclusionary clause. And that's where we are today. So that's pretty exciting. That's very that exciting. That is really exciting. Um, and, and there are parts of even today's political world that are incredibly exciting. I think in the last two recent elections, we've elected uh, many more LGBTQ candidates and transgender uh, candidates, as Monica had mentioned. Now, Thank you, Monica, for yeah. all that information. I, I knew some, but not all of them. <laughs> yeah, and, but there's also something else that Monica had mentioned, which is the transgender community uh, routinely left out of um, you know, our biggest fights in our movement <clears throat> and by members of our own community. Yep. And, and I know you know a lot about that, and I think what we mean by saying, you know, you being the uh, legislator who's done a whole lot to advance LGBTQ rights, you're, uh, what we mean is that you've been inclusive of transgender rights, and whereas many other LGB of the alphabet soup, if you will, you know, hadn't. Right. Someone like Barney Frank, for example, in our fight for an uh, e equal rights bill. Yes. So how do, you, how do we get more of yous even <laughs> in our own community? So clearly some of what I'm talking about goes back 20 years, so it's, it's history, but I think there's value of looking at it if only in that historic environment and context. So Barney Frank, we love Barney Frank. He was such a great leader and did so many good things. How could he have not fought for an inclusive change in federal law with regard to housing and employment, public accommodation? He made a political calculation. He had talked with his colleagues, and he thought, we can't even get sexual orientation. If we're going to also do trans, uh, gender identity at the same time, it's going to fail. And he, was, he thought he was being pragmatic, and it caused... and. and HRC leadership at the time was saying, there were protests in the street in San Francisco and we had to choose sides and it was a real debate within our own community. And I shared with you this uh, little story earlier. I remember Nancy Pelosi, my congressional member, this was when she was just entering leadership in the House long before she became speaker, convened some of our community leaders and elected leaders to, at her office for a meeting. And I had to point out to her something that I could see her mind change in an instant. And she told me, oh, now I get it. And I told her that an inclusive bill was just essential and mandatory. And, and when she questioned me, I said, let me lay it out for you. So I'm protected as a gay man because it is now at least in the state of California, from 1999, and it took us 22 years here in California to do it, still no federal protections, and still no protections in 30 states across the nation, protecting just sexual orientation. So I could be denied housing, employment, a hotel room in 30 states just because I'm a gay man. But what I shared with Nancy on that day was, so okay, if you protect sexual orientation from discrimination in the law, but not gender identity, I apply for a job, I'm, I'm applying for an apartment. The person in charge of making that decision, either up or down on me, doesn't have a clue who's in my bed. But if they don't want me, it's because of some expression of who I am. That's my gender identity. And so you can protect 
me on basis of sexual orientation, but that employer can say, I don't hire effeminate men. You're not getting your job and that's perfectly legal. So I was protected, but it did me no good whatsoever. And if we can better educate people that by having this inclusive legislation, we're not protecting just our transgender brothers and sisters, if, if that weren't enough. It's also protecting every man and woman, gay or straight, that's all of us, who doesn't fit a particular idea of someone in power making decisions in hiring, in promoting, in employment, in, in housing decisions and in public accommodation. Any man, gay or straight, who isn't masculine enough, any woman, gay or straight, who isn't feminine enough and doesn't fit these very restrictive gender norms, we're all out of luck. So we can get people into the conversation of the need for making these changes by informing them it could be you, it could be your sister, it could be your brother, it could be anybody in your world, and then better explain to them who our transgender community actually is. And so as I say, when I shared that with Nancy, she said, oh, I get it, <laughs> it has to be, it has to be inclusive. But even here in California, our own community didn't make any noise when California added sexual orientation to our Fair Employment and Housing Act, 1999. When I got to the assembly in 2003, I authored the bill to further include gender identity, but there were four years. And even our community in California didn't make much noise about it being exclusive in 1999. So even within our own community, we are evolving. We have evolved. I want to tell you, Mark, I mean, not just through your work, but even through your character and, and uh, uh, the many folks who have been proud to say that you're their friend um, and not just their representative in office. Uh, but a community neighbor, uh, that you, what you do, you, you really do exemplify the ally, um, you know, role really well within our community. You stand up and you speak out against the injustice or the discrimination, and, and then you were in a role to actually act upon it. And so what we want to do as we wind down is really get your thoughts on what advice would you give all of us, community members, corporate leaders, community leaders, activists, elected leaders, um, to ensure that this epidemic that's plaguing our community and impacting black trans women, you know, that, that we do something about it, that there is a solution. And I would imagine that it would have to include policies all the way down to a cultural shift in our communities. Yes. So I, I want to credit Equality California, who has been our partner legislatively over these past couple of decades. They've sponsored every piece of uh, queer-related civil rights legislation. And so we need partners. They do the lobbying. They help us. Uh, a single member only has so much staff and to get around to, in the assembly, 80 members, and keep in mind, a Senate bill has to go to the assembly, an assembly bill has to go to the Senate. That's a lot of offices to cover. And so it's, it's groups like Equality California who, who help us in that work. I know these are very dark days and it is difficult for all of us to keep the faith and remain positive as this maniac goes about destroying everything that is foundational to our democracy. I pray every day and I just know that I have to believe that there will be justice for him and all of those who have helped him in his destruction of our democracy. So we're gonna get out of this darkness. I don't know how it all plays out, but it is playing out as we speak. So keep that faith and, and put it into social justice work at whatever level you can, whether it's in an employee group here at your place of work, uh, the 
endless opportunities there are within our community to volunteer uh, at Tony's place, as she's graciously offered, to volunteer to get on a board of directors, to raise some money for a good cause. There's no greater self-satisfying work that a human being can do than to be a soldier, to play a part, to take on a leadership role, fighting for justice. The work is endless. The work is endless. And, and don't forget that as we make progress, yeah, I think it was Barack Obama who said so beautifully, you know, that bending of the arc is not a straight line. We take two steps up, we fall a step back, we take another step and a half, then we lose two. And it's a zigzag, and, but we make progress. So the kind of lobbying I had to do, convincing, educating of my just Democratic colleagues, leaving all the Republicans out, unfortunately, to get our inclusive amendment to the Fair Employment and Housing Act back in 2003 took time and effort. But once we crossed that hurdle, within the Democratic caucus in Sacramento today, a transgender bill, they shrug their shoulders. Of course they're going to vote for it. It's, just, it's not a question. Democrats support civil rights. And transgender civil rights are now within that broader umbrella. That is progress. We shouldn't take it for granted. And it makes that kind of work legislatively easier today. So we can focus on heavier lifts in other areas. Uh, that, and and, and there, what, what the legislators are doing today in Sacramento on this subject have to do with some of the nitty and grittier, finer points of challenges to daily life. How difficult should it be for me to change my de gender designation on my driver's license? Let's make that easier. Let's now have M, F, and bi non-binary. Uh, let's do that. And they're getting these things done and our Democratic governors are signing them into law. Doesn't sound like much on the stage today, but it is a major change in just the ability to live an authentic life here in California. So we make those steps forward and makes everything else that much easier. Uh, of course, in other states, it's like night and day. So I can't speak with all that much authority or experience in these other states, but uh, it's great to work at, with corporate, and I don't, I'm not always a friend of big corporations uh, because I'm fighting for consumer rights oftentimes as a legislator, as activist, but to see the power of someone like Mark Benioff of Salesforce's voice saying he won't do business in North Carolina. He won't open a satellite office in these states, Texas and Indiana and others. And he'll take on their governors who sign these hateful bills. And when they start talking dollars and cents, they wake up. Mm -hmm. They may not understand what human, human rights and dignity are all about, but they get. They want Mark Benioff's money and they want an opportunity for him to create jobs in their state. So that's inspirational to see that we do have friends in corporate America. Uh, and, and Mark Benioff's doing it, if I can just focus on him, because he is a rare voice, not just on the issues we're talking about here today, but interrelated issues like homelessness, that we, he wants to pay a higher corporate tax rate in San Francisco so that we can collectively raise more than $300 million annually in San Francisco. This was our Prop C, which fell just short of a two-thirds vote. But he was a lone corporate voice in, in supporting such a thing. So we've got to find our allies where we can. We're talking about allies with and without our side of our queer community and outside of our progressive 
uh, community activism. We have corporate friends as well, and they can play a very big role. And as Gilead is playing today, a very big role. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your service, your contributions, um, your friendship, and your allyship to all of us in our communities. Let me grab a moment, Michelle, just to say yeah. it goes both ways. And Michelle's voice and leadership, now partnering with uh, Commonwealth Club, you've taken your work from here to here, and we're so proud of you, and we're so appreciative of everything you do. Yeah. Thank you.